only on Daystar. We're so delighted that you've tuned in today. Stay tuned. Pastor Rod Parsley is here live from Columbus, Ohio. Loyal live here, not in Columbus, but from Columbus. And Dr. David Ireland is here from New York area, New Upper New Jersey. Pastor is a great church of some 7,000 members. He leads chapel services, Joni, for the NFL, the New York Giants, the New York Jets, and also at the Pentagon in Washington, D.C. He's written 20 books, including this new one entitled The Kneeling Warrior, Winning Your Battles Through Prayer, and forward by our dear friend, Dr. R.T. Kendall. Mm -hmm. So let's welcome Dr. David Ireland. Okay, so do you have a Yankee accent? I do. <laughs> I have a Yankee cap also. <laughs> oh, you're a Yankees fan. What's Yankees that about fan. Derek yeah. Jeter's final season, I know, Hall of a, Fame it's, career? It's a loss for, for the baseball players in general. <laughs> so are you from New Jersey originally? I was born in Jamaica, West Indies, and I came to America when I was eight years old. Oh, Grew wow. up in New York City. And then came to New Jersey at 16 when I started college, and I've been there ever since. And so, did you start Christ Church? I did. My wife and I we planted Christ Church 28 years ago, and so we started with six people. And God's been so gracious to us. Church is about 7,500 people. We've planted a number of churches out of our congregation. So, we're thankful to the Lord. I like uh, it, uh, Joni. It's multi-site and multi-racial. Yeah, I love that. So reaching out to everybody. It is. <laughs> and we have a promo that shows you more about Christ Church. Let's watch that together. Hello, I'm David Ireland. I'm the senior pastor of Christ Church. We began in 1986 with six others besides my wife and I. Over the years, God's been so kind, He's allowed thousands of people to come our way and worship with us on the weekends that call Christ Church their home. In fact, we have two locations. We refer to them as East Campus and West Campus. Our East Campus is in Montclair. It's a 100-year-old cathedral, a Romanesque cathedral, beautiful cathedral that makes you feel like you're in Europe somewhere. And then where I'm standing is actually the entrance of our West Campus in Rockaway. We are an evangelical church, an independent church. Evangelical in that we believe that the Bible is God's Word and Jesus Christ is the hope of mankind. Let me take you inside. Christ commissioned us to go out into the world and share the gospel and to love and to serve. And we do that through global missions to some 35 countries. We bring the gospel, but also meet their felt needs just right there. And so we believe that this is a call beyond just our community to reach the world and to love and to serve. One of the things David and I are so passionate about is building strong families, simply by coming alongside of them and sharing truths, relevant truths from the Bible that are so pertinent for the problems we all face today. Our church is connecting to people. And so our motto has always been this, Christ Church exists to unite people to God and people to people. Our hope is that you come and explore our community and see what we have to offer you, that you may be the kind of person that God ordained you to be. Thank you. So I'm holding in my hand the book, The Kneeling Warrior. It's also an endorsement by Jim Cimbala of Brooklyn Tabernacle. What is the kneeling warrior? Tell us in a layman's terms. Well, it seems like a, a very odd term when you connect warrior with prayer. Kneeling is a posture. It comes from, it's a posture of prayer. And I drew that imagery out of Daniel 6 when three times a day Daniel would go to the room upstairs and pray. And here's a guy that was totally involved in government for Babylon, very secularized nation, but yet he was a man devoted to God in prayer. And he spent time in prayer on a regular basis. And he was a warrior in prayer. And I, the book has its foundation also out of 1 Samuel 30, where David was in Ziklag, in Philistine territory. He's there because Saul was trying to kill him. And, when and then when he came home one day, 
All of the village was burned to, a, to the ground. The 600 men were there with him as warriors. Their wives, their children were, were kidnapped. And these men, big burly men, started weeping uncontrollably. Once they controlled themselves, the Bible says that David went into prayer and he prayed, said, God, should I pursue yes. the Amalekites? And, and then he listened afterwards. And God said, pursue them. And so the book is, David was a guy who was powerful in worship, but powerful in warfare. Before he even went into war, he prayed and said, God, what do you want me to do? And God says, go chase after them. So the book is about telling people, you need to know how to pray warfare prayers to a warrior God who will answer you and help you come through crisis because oftentimes we give up too easily. And so the Christian faith was birthed out of crisis. And, you know, Tertullian, one of the church fathers says that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. The more we're wow. mowed down, the more we grow. And so the whole idea of being a Christian is that we're not supposed to be so quiet and, and, and docile. Rather, we should take on a mindset that says, let me war for the purpose of God. And so I talk about that in the, in the book. So Dr. Ireland, can you give us a kneeling warrior moment for you personally? Ooh, good, question. <laughs> good question. And that was when we were vying for our campus, our West Campus, 107 acre property. We went through a major battle to try to secure the property for a church. And we had to go through lawsuits and all kinds of fights. I had to have armed bodyguards with me for six wow. years in order to deal with all of the issues surrounding this, bring a church to a community. And so I had to learn how to pray. I said, God, this is what you've called us to have, this property for your glory. I need you to break through whatever you need to do. It's like, uh, you know, Charles Spurgeon, a great English preacher said, when a guy asked him, how could you defend God and defend the Bible? He said, I don't need to defend God, neither do I need to defend the Bible. The same way I don't need to defend a lion. I just let him out of his cage and he defends himself. <laughs> like and so that. prayer is really saying, God, I need you to get into the battle. And prayer is God's invitation into the battle. Mm -hmm. And so once I invited God into that arena, the rest is history. We enjoy the property. You saw it on the video. And, uh, and I'm telling people the same thing. We need to fight for our marriages, fight yes. for our children, fight for our yes. careers, and not have this kind of you know, quiet, uh, docile perspective when it comes to the things that God's called us to have in terms of his promises. Jesus did it in Luke 22 when he said to Peter, he said, Simon, Simon, Satan has is, is asked permission to sift you as wheat. And when you look at it textually, he already had Judas. Simon Peter is next. And if Simon Peter topples, all of the apostles will topple because he's one of the key guys. And Jesus said this. He said, but I've prayed for you, Simon. So he used the weapon of prayer. He could have called, as we find in Matthew 26, he could have called 12 legions of angels. A legion in those times was 5,400 Roman soldiers. 12 was over 64,000 soldiers. Jesus could have done that to fight Satan, but he didn't do that. He simply said to Simon, quieting his heart, he said, Simon, I have prayed for you. And so what I talk about in the book is the weapon of prayer and how to use it, both in terms of offensive weapon, as a defensive weapon, and really understanding how to go after the stuff that Satan has stolen from us. Amen. Pastor, I wonder, I really feel like there, there are some of you watching today and and we, we talked at the front of the program that you're just in a really desperate situation. You don't know what you're going to do or how you're going to get out of the situation. And that's why you've kept watching today because, I don't know, it's hard times cause us many times to get on our knees and look to God. And we turn the channel off the secular stuff and we go to where we can receive inspiration and prayer and encouragement. That's why you're watching today. I want you just to take a moment, Pastor, to look into the camera and encourage those that are watching today that are in those desperate situations. And I know we're going to pray at the end of the program, but if you would just pray a prayer right now with those that are watching as you feel directed by the Holy Spirit. Appreciate that, Joni. I want you to understand that the Holy Spirit's all about liberating you and setting you free. And so I want to pray with you right now, just like David prayed, should I go after the, the Amalekites? Should I pursue them? And God didn't back down. God simply said, go after them. In other words, I got your back. And I want to pray right now because the Holy Spirit has your back. And so whatever the crisis is, would you agree with me 
that the Lord may just do a deliverance, a mighty Thank breakthrough. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. And so, Father, I ask today Hallelujah. that you would penetrate every home, every circumstance, every situation that may look difficult. It may look as if they're hemmed in, blocked in. There's no way of escape. I pray whatever it takes, Lord, just do your stuff. Let there be a divine breaking free. Set children free. Set spouses free. Set careers free. I pray for those who are struggling with, with medical challenges that you'd let healing flow in their bodies from the crown of their head to the soles of their feet. Those are entangled in legal entanglements that feel as if they're just trapped. I ask you, Jesus, step into the courtroom. Be the litigator. Yes, Defend their cause. Set them free. Show yourself strong. And may you out of this, Lord, bring many to a saving knowledge of your dear son. And may many turn their hearts again towards you. Lord, I say alongside of Paul, that our pain has turned us to you. So let our pain turn us to you today. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. And the other thing that I sense, I'm glad you said that about litigation, is there's someone you're dealing with the lawsuit situation, and God is saying, uh, I'm going to help you with that. There's also like a custody battle going on with someone that's watching today. And the thing that just kept coming to me over and over is, is the Lord said, I'm going to help you with that, but I need you to walk in love. Oh, I need you to walk good. in love because you've got all these feelings and emotions yes. and, and anger. And he's saying, if you'll walk in love and give it to me and trust me, I'm going to supernaturally work these things out for good. And, and for my glory. And Joni, I'm having a word of knowledge as well. There's a woman who's leaking fluid out of the right ear. It's wow. very pussy. And the Lord's healing you right now as I speak. And maybe right. you need to call in and give oh. us that testimony. But the Lord's doing something transformational. You've been losing your hearing in that ear. God's healing that as well. Receive it Amen. in well, Jesus' name. Well, give God the glory and call and give a praise report. We want to hear about it. Our guest today is Dr. David Ireland of Christ Church in New Jersey. And he's written a new book entitled The Kneeling Warrior. And one of the concepts that you compare prayer to is the ring the bell yes. concept of the Navy SEALs. Yes. Explain that to our viewers. Well, the Navy SEAL, they take people through training. And the worst week is called Hell Week. And so during Hell Week, you're kept up for lots of hours over the course of the week, and you're going through the most intense, grueling, physical kind of challenges, swimming, obstacle courses, everything. But there's a bell in the center of the compound that any individual going through the training, if you feel as if it's too difficult for you, no questions asked. You go, walk away from whatever the apparatus, whatever the swimming you've been doing, go over to the bell, ring it, take your helmet off, put it at the base of the bell, and what that symbolizes is this, that you, are, you realize this is not for me, I'm quitting, I can't do it. And I use that imagery to say to people that many times people have rung the bell when it comes to prayer. And they have taken off their helmet as a warrior in the army of the Lord. And they've mm. taken off that helmet and put it at the base of the cross wow. and saying, Lord Jesus, <clears throat> prayer doesn't work. I'm not going to talk to you any longer. I'm not going to request anything anymore because you don't answer me and you don't speak to me. As a consequence, I've rung the bell. And I'm saying to people that we need to know the laws of prayer, just like the laws of gravity, the laws of buoyancy, the laws of thermodynamics. If we don't understand the laws of prayer, then we're praying in futility and we're getting angry with God when we've, in essence, violated the laws. It's like me jumping out of a window and expecting to fly. You know, I'm violating the laws of gravity. I shouldn't be angry with God if I come crashing That's down right. to the ground. Uh -huh. Well, if I violate the laws of prayer and my prayers are not answered, why should I be angry with God and why should I ring the bell? Rather, I should then learn what are the laws of prayer why, why does God not answer prayer? Or what are the kinds of prayers that God doesn't answer? And so I, I outline in the book the four laws of prayer so that we can then be assured that God says to us in his word, you know, seek me and I'll answer you. Prayer is God's design. He initiated yes. prayer, invited prayer, welcomes prayer. He responds to prayer. Prayer is the language of, of God. And so when we understand those laws, like one of the laws is that you have not if you ask not. So if you don't ask, God is saying, prayerlessness keeps me out of your situation. Mm. Prayer invites me into your circumstance. Another aspect of, you know, of the laws of prayer is our motive and our motivation. If our motive and our motivation is wrong, incorrect, then 
what assurance do we have? We have no confidence when we pray because God says, you ask, you ask that you may seek it, you, know, you ask that you may consume it on your own lust. And so he's not going to grant us something that is going to be so self-absorbed and self-consumed and can care less about the kingdom of God or the great big picture. So God says, you know, so our motivation affects whether or not our prayers are going to be answered. Well, you know, prayer is not a get wish, uh, your, your wish list. It's not just uh, a get out of jail free card. It is fellowship with God. It is conversation with God. God wants you to spend time with him. And Dr. Ireland made such a good point when he said, David, stop and listen to what God had to say. There's a time to stop and listen, be still and know that I am God. One of the things you say here in conclusion today is it's good to have a set time and a set place for prayer. Why is that? Correct. And when Jesus talked, when Jesus was praying in Luke 11, one of the most interesting is, you know, circumstance, the Bible says in Luke 11, verse 1, when Jesus finished, he was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. And so prayer then, I say, have it, establish a set time. Why? Because it's in the audience that you're having, a, you're having an appointment with God. Oh, good. When you have a set time, it helps to guard your prayer because it's very significant. We shouldn't just pray when we're in a crisis. Prayer, as you mentioned, it's fellowship, it's communion, it's intimacy with God. When we establish a set time of prayer, that's, that helps to make our life of prayer strong and intimate because powerful things happen when we pray. We also have a set place of prayer. And there's nothing magical about it. What it does is that it creates a sense of no distractions, it creates limited disturbances. Like Daniel, he had a set place of prayer. He went to his upstairs room facing Jerusalem as a set time of prayer. Why? Because when set time, three times a day, set place, because he was familiar with the place. He's not distracted by it. All of us as human beings, we're very fastidious. I know that if I'm in a room, if I'm not used to that room, I'm looking, is the picture on the wall crooked? It's crooked, it's distracting to me. So I need to go into a room where I'm very familiar. And you may, th a person may say, and one of the viewers may be thinking, look, I have wall-to-wall -wall kids everywhere turned as a child. <laughs> I have no private place. But let me tell you about Susanna Wesley, the mother of John and Charles Wesley. She had 19 children, but she had a set place of prayer. And what she would do would take her apron, Marcus, and throw it over her head. And she wow. taught her children, whenever you see mother with her apron over her head, she's in her place of prayer, never disturb her. In other words, we need to have this set place, even if we may not have a mansion or you'll have a, several extra bedrooms or even an extra space. We go into the bathroom, go into the kitchen, sit at the table, wherever, or even if you have to take an old t-shirt and throw it over your head and establish a set place of prayer, it creates a regularity, it creates discipline. I like that. It creates a place where you can be able to say, I'm communing with God. Then I also say, have a set agenda of prayer. What are you going to pray about? You'll have an idea. List it down. So I talk about people problems, you know, passions, you know, I, I pray about those things. So it keeps me in this sense of this sense when I, when God answers my prayers, I'm not the only one that'll know. In other words, I should be praying about my city, praying about my nation, praying about the individuals that are the you know, war-torn nations of the world. So yes. when God responds to prayer, it's not something so private and individualized that no one else has benefited but me. That's too selfish. That's not kingdom. And so I brought broad people's perspective. Well, and when you pray and you have a set place, it probably doesn't need to be in front of the TV, in front of the computer, or in front of your smartphone. Get along with God. You know, you would, if you're intimate with your spouse, you're going to be in a private place because you're focusing totally on them the same way with our God. Well, the book is entitled The Kneeling Warrior. It's by Dr. David Ireland. There is the website, davidireland.org. I'm sure you can go on Amazon and download it as well. Stay tuned in just a moment. Pastor Rod Parsley from World Harvest Church in Columbus, Ohio. If this message today has rung the bell in your heart and you say, hey, I need prayer, pray with me. Join your heart and your faith with me about this situation of life. Then call us. That's why we're here. That's why we've had a toll-free number for years, not just during offering time, but all the time. Or 
your electronic and high tech, go to daystar.com and click on prayer and send it electronically.